Second session of the day is Jahangir to Dara Shuko, the Magnificent Mughals. Should interest all the history buffs here. Parvati Sharma and Avik Chanda discuss the mighty and might have been in Mughal history in conversation with Jayanta Sen Gupta. Quick introductions. Parvati Sharma is an author who has written across genres. She has worked as a travel writer, editor, and journalist. She's working on her second biography at present. Avik Chanda is an author, business advisor, entrepreneur, and trainer with two poetry collections in Bengali and two books published in English to his credit. Dr. Joyanta Shengupta is a secretary and curator of the Victoria Memorial Hall and a former director of the Indian Museum. He's a historian of modern India with research interests in the interrelationship between colonialism, naturalism, nationalism, and democracy and nationalism. If I may please request members of the audience to take their seats. And if Parvati could join us. Parvati's right here as well. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we are about to start this session, uh, which is on Jangi to Dara Shuko, the Magnificent Mughals, in which I have these two speakers, Parvati Sharma and Avik Chanda, who have both come out with fascinating books on two figures, Jangir and Dara Shuko. We are going to learn about them. But this is very interesting that both of these books have come out at a time in which we can broadly see a sort of demughalization going on. Uh, we have lost Mughal Sarai, which is now Dindayal Upadhyay Nagar. Uh, we have lost Ilahabad, which is now Prayag Raj. Uh, however, in the midst of all of this, there seems to be a renewal of interest in the history of the Mughals. The Mughals are part of our being. Uh, we, have, we have grown up with the Mughals. Uh, we have read about them from junior school onwards. Many of us have memorized the, the sequence of the great Mughals uh, in different ways. And we remember and memorialize them for various things, for the grand edifices they built, uh, <coughs> for, you know, for, for, for their policies, for their stunning conquest, many other things. But here are, <coughs> so uh, the, the, the term Great Mughals, which is a sequence from Babur to Aurangzeb, represent perhaps a set of people, six people, who are the most well-researched and well-documented in, in global history. But out of them, uh, the authors that we have with us here today, uh, Parvati and Avik, you have chosen two people that are sort of outliers in this set. Parvati, you have chosen Jahangir. Who is this kind of person who is in between, who is flanked, who is bookended at either end by Akbar the Great and Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal, who built the grand edifice that Rabindranath Tagore described as a teardrop on the cheek of eternity. But you have chosen Jahangir, who was a person deemed to have been overshadowed by not only those two great, the, the two great Mughals, Akbar and Shah Jahan, but also was, was thought of as being overshadowed by his wife, Noor Jahan, uh, who sort of is, is thought of as, as having run the empire uh, by proxy, especially during the later days. So I'm going to first you know, open the discussion by asking each of you about your selection. 
Parvati, why after you you ha you have written on Babar, you have written a wonderful children's book on Babar, uh, but why did you choose Jahangir, who seems to us to be a transitional character, the only image that sticks to us of Jahangir the Great Mughal is a, a weak monarch who is overshadowed by various people and who is heavily into drinking and substance abuse. Uh, the only positive image which we have perhaps of his, and we will come, come, come back later to that, of, uh, of, of the anarchy uh, legend, if I may say so. But first tell us, uh, if you could say us, what, what, what is it about Jahangir that fascinated you and led you uh, to select him for your biography? Uh, well, thank, first of all, thank you very much, Jant. It's lovely to be here with you and with you, Avik. Thank you for having me here. Um, I think there were two, two reasons, really, for, for, for choosing Jahangir. Primarily, the first one was because having done, written about Babar, I had read the Babar Nama. And, uh, I had discovered what a pleasure it is and what a rare opportunity it is to be able to access somebody through their own writings. You know, and there are many histories of the Mughals written at the time, but Babur and Jahangir are the only two who wrote their, their own. And that kind of intimacy that you can get reading a 16th, 17th century emperor writing in their own words is really... It's a it's a treasure, you know, and especially for a writer, and especially for for a novelist, it really gives you an insight into the character. And Jahangir's uh, memoirs, the Jahangir Nama, is if anything even more readable and lucid and entertaining, you know, than uh, than Babur. So this image of a weak man. Uh, is completely negated by the fact of him being a very strong, very good writer. You know, he's capable of building, uh, uh, describing beautifully the landscapes, the people, the cultures, the history of the Hindustan of which he is an, uh, an emperor. And secondly, I think during the course of, of researching and then writing, it, 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 beca it became more and more clear to me, you know, I mean, you're, you, you started by talking about this demogalization. But even before, there's, you, I think generally when it comes to history, there's a tendency to see things in black and white. With the Mughals, also this exists. You know, so, so there's always been this idea of the Mughals, there's the good Mughal and the bad Mughal. So there's Akbar and then there's Aurangzeb, right? And they all come with this baggage. So when you write about Akbar, you have to have this idea of... Uh, in either case, you have certain fixed ideas that you have to uh, either agree with or, or, or critique or you know engage with in some way. But in the case of Jahangir, because he has been so thoroughly ignored <laughs> by history, there was no pressure like this, and it was possible then to see uh, you know Jahangir not in terms of you know on the one hand secular, on the one on the other hand communal, but to see him with at a minimum three hands. You know, so for example. Um, this is a man who uh, who comes to power with the backing of a conservative Sunni uh, Muslim faction in the court, which is thoroughly disgusted with all the heresies of Akbar. Uh, on the other hand, he is also a man who is described as you know irredeemably atheist by travelers, particularly Thomas Rowe, who says you know this man cannot believe; he does not have the capacity to for faith. And you know, on the third hand, this is the same man who has a deep spiritual uh, connection with the Brahmin ascetic, you know, called uh, Jadrup Gosen, whom he visits many, many times and has these prolonged and clearly very meaningful conversations with, you know. Or, or to give another example, you know, he at one point he's the product himself of uh, of a mixed marriage, you know, for inter 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 religious marriage. Uh, on the other hand, he at one point he goes to a place called Rajor. He finds you know some um, Muslim converts who are practicing interfaith marriage, and he bans it. And on the third hand, he has his nephews converted to Christianity so that they may get Portuguese brides. You know, so he's just and and because we have there's no pressure on you know on, on on us to see him in one way or the other we can see him uh, as a combination of so many different contradictory impulses and yet making a you know credible whole and i found that very fascinating in the course of uh, writing thank you so much thank you so much uh, parvati 
Uh, on that point, Parvati just told us about the binary between Akbar and Aurangzeb, which is a classic binary. We have read about this also in the discovery of India by Nehru. Um, you know, there is another binary between Aurangzeb and, and Darashukra. Uh, and your book on Darashukra is, is titled The Man Who Would Be King. Uh, and there is another book just out by Supriya Gandhi about Darashuku, which is said, Darashuku, the emperor that never was. Um, we know who became the emperor, but it, you know, sort of both your title and the other title convey a sort of yearning for Darashuku. This is the man who could have been king, who could have been our emperor. We almost wanted him to be our emperor. And all of this is because of the image that sticks out of Darashuko as somebody who was a mystic, uh, a universalist, almost secular, uh, so contrasting with Aurangzeb. Uh, so, if you, you know, and 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 as as you have also described in in your epilogue, this very poignant instance of. Darashiko's almost forlorn grave's grave lying in the Humayun's tomb complex, uh, in which you have this conversation with uh, another traveler who is saying that, you know, to somebody whom history has given ref refuge, what can Aurangzeb do? So, for a person who did not become king and who fell through the trapdoor of history, and you have written a biography on that. The, 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 both, both of these are works of nonfiction. Tell us a bit about our selection. What is it about Darashuko that you wanted to highlight? And the kind of images that we have Darashuko, is there all that there was to this man? Or is there something more of a, you know, a more of a nuanced narrative that you chose to depict for us? Please tell us about your selection. Um, so, so John did our first half, what was happening was about two and a half, three years ago, I had published a, a book with Harper Collins, and that was a business book, because I come from a corporate background. And therefore, um, the temptation was there to, to do another business book, to follow it up with something you know, more of the same. And what I then told myself is, let me not do that, and let me, in fact, take up something which is a complete passion project. And you know, being, being a history buff, and like so many of my generation, having grown up with the legends of the Mughals and so forth, um, I, I decided that, yes, let's write a story on the Mughals. And I was, I was quite sure in my mind that it would have to be about a historical personage as opposed to an historical event, such as Battle of Panipat, on which, you know, again, we have books. And therein, when I started to do my reading, and you have great works on Shah Jahan, on Aurangzeb, um, you know, spanned actually over 100 years. So going all the way back to the early 1900s, um, the, the five volume tomes that came out from Sir Jodhna Chaukar, yeah. and then literally 100 years later, Audrey Trashke's book, so revisiting Aurangzeb. And you have glimpses of Dara across all of these. You have the book on Shah Jahan, you have, you have an excellent biography of Jahanara as well. And through all of these books, you get glimpses of Dara Shukur, but it's like this, this imperial chamber, and the spotlight is always on the principal character or the protagonist, and Dara Shukur is, so to speak, sort of waiting in the wings, right? In, in just outside your, your you know, sphere of vision. And then I, I sort of told myself, why do I not bring that character into the limelight and do a book where the spotlight is only on Dara Shukur? So a specific reason why I wanted to do that because, see, uncannily at the moment, Dara is is you know is is hot and uh, controversial for all kinds of reasons. But at that point of time, like three years back, the only thing of of note that had happened was that Dalhousie Road in in New Delhi had just been renamed Dara Shukur Road. But that was it. There was no other controversy. There was no symposium. There was no you know setting up of uh, a special chair in Aligarh Muslim University uh, for, for research of inclusion and, and diversity and Dara Shukur chair. It's a, nothing, nothing of that, right? Uh, so my research was telling me that 350 plus years have, have passed since Dara Shukur's death. And in all of this time, there have been only two monographs. Literature, a lot. 
plays a lot, both in India and in Pakistan, yes? And very good uh, quality plays. But if you're talking about biography, serious biography, non-fiction, there were only two. There was one which is written by Kolikaranjan Kanungo, like mid-1930s, and then 1953, Bishop Bharati publication of Bikram Jit Hazrat. And I said, all right, so maybe now it is the time uh, and it's uncanny that Shupriya's books also come out around exactly the same time. So I told myself, look, this is the time to revisit Dara Shakur and look at his life again in maybe in modern terms and, and to try and bring him to life. So that was, that was my, my project. Uh, if I may, I'll make yes, one more observation, and that's what you started off with, the, the demogalization. Yes. Um, so Professor Deepesh Chakravorty, right? Um, he, uh, amongst one of his very many seminal works and articles, is one where he talks about post-coloniality and the, the artifice of history. Yeah. So he how are we? Our past. How yeah. are we interpreting yes. India's past? Who is talking about India's past, yeah. right? And his main thesis, this is like 10, 12 years back that he published his work, is that. For the longest time, including Jodhanath Shorka, Ramesh Chandra Mojumdar, and, and all the other historians of the early part of the 20th century, the narrative was still very much through the prism of the Europeans, through the rulers, right? And how, after independence, the post-colonial push, you, you see, let's say, through the, the AMU revolution, if you will, right? Iqtadar Alam Khan, Athar Ali, Irfan Habib Saab, right? Shirin Mosvi. So all of them are basically pushing against that, and this is a new narrative, yes. which is the anti-colonial narrative. And now what we are seeing is the anti-colonial, anti-colonial narrative. So we'll probably come full circle, or maybe it's not a full circle, it's just some bizarre arc that goes nowhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avik. Uh, I just want to come back to Parvati um, and her book on Jahangir. So, uh, as, as you so aptly say, it's only Babur and Jahangir who write their autobiographies. And Jahangir is somebody who would seem to be, according to conventional wisdom, uh, not a person whom you would expect to write a memoir. Uh, please tell us about the flavor that comes out of uh, his memoir, you know, the, the, the kind of writing an autobiography or a memoir is, is something which, which needs a lot of determination, a lot of dedication. And you wouldn't normally uh, identify Jahangir as, as a person likely to do that. So when you, when you read his memoirs, what kind of a person, you know, what kind of a self-writing, self-image that comes out? Is there, is he self-indulgent, neutral? Self-critical, what? And you, you are you are looking at the world through his eyes, yeah. right? Yeah. So please, please tell us ab about and somebody who has written both fiction and non-fiction. Yeah. Uh, read us about the the flavor of reading his memoirs and and you know, getting a sense of both the character and the age yeah. that he was looking at. Well, I mean, uh, I well, I could just talk endlessly about his memoirs. I enjoyed them so much. You know, I think one thing is he is you get from it the clear sense that he is a very skillful writer because he has you he gets you on his side. You know, you are you are you are you you are inclined to believe him. You are inclined to be sympathetic towards him. <coughs> Even when he does very um unsympathetic things. For example, within the first few pages uh, he's talking about how he had um, Abul Fazl, who was uh, Akbar's, you know, very, very loyal courtier and, and his biographer, uh, murdered. He says that Abul Fazl was always saying snide things, making snide remarks about me. And uh, so I called uh, this, I sent a message to Beer Singh Bundela and said, can you please have this man taken care of? And, and, he <laughs> and indeed he waylaid him and had his head, cut off his head. And uh, and it, you know it's 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 cold blooded murder, right? But uh, you know you one he just he writes it so frankly, you know he's he's just so honest about it that you that you have to admire just at least the fact that he's admitting it. He's not trying to hide it. And secondly, I think once you start reading more deeply, then it's also perhaps uh, it gives you an impression of the age, right? Because in the 17th century, a would be emperor ordering somebody who is in the way of the throne having him killed is not is not 
a mark of 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 evil or of murderous tendency, but a, but a mark of strength. Yeah. You know, he is ensuring his path to the throne, and that is his duty as uh, as a as a prince. Yes. So, uh, so, so there are these kind of contradictions that emerge uh, em emerge in the writing. Uh, he, 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 you also see him. You know, you see the, the kind of discipline that he had because again, he writes very frankly about his drinking. You know, and at the, in the, some very entertaining passages, he talks about. <coughs> How he used to drink 20 goblets of double distilled liquor in a day, uh, 14 during the day and and the remaining after after dark. And just ju uh, just an, uh, a, a small digression is that I work a little bit on the history of food, and I have I have read in the works of the great food historian Katie Achaya yeah. uh, that Jahangir was you know he was this great drinker, 20 glasses of wine uh, per day at least, um, but. He ordered everything in the Mughal kitchen to be wa uh, to, to be cooked with Ganges water. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. and Akbar also. I think Akbar is yeah. the one who starts it. They only drank water from the Ganga and cooked in it. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. So, so no, so he so he drank these these twenty goblets a day, and then uh, you know eventually he says I, my, his hands used to shake so much he couldn't even hold the glass himself. Somebody else would have to pour the liquor down his throat, and uh, then he realizes that he needs perhaps to consult a doctor on this subject. And the doctor arrives, and the doctor says to him, if you continue like this, you'll be dead in six months. And then, you know, you see that this man has a will to survive, because he, he two of his brothers die of drink. They can't control it. He brings it down to this very strict regimen of, uh, you know, diluting his liquor with wine, substituting the daytime drinking with opium, and, you know, the various sort of measures like this that <laughs> That make allow him to in fact survive and then to rule for uh, 22 years, which is no mean uh, no mean feat. So so again, you see this combination of a sort of dissolute, seemingly dissolute personality that also has a uh, has a strong um, uh, sense of discipline, like a you know. And thirdly, what you see perhaps in, in the Jahangir Nama is this obsessive desire to document, which is, uh, which is I think, not he's not alone in this. You know, the, the Babar onwards, the, the, the Mughals are, uh, are writing down everything that they, that they observe. So he, uh, you know, he, he, will, he, will, he, will, he will document everything from the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the width of this cave in which Jadrup Gosen meditates to the date on which the last mango of the season is given to him, to the size of a particularly large peach, to the number of cherries that he, uh, that he you know, plucks from a tree. And also to, you know, to, he writes these beautiful passages on the, on the, on the melodies of Tan Sen and the, and, the, and the metaphors of Hindustan poetry and of the you know the landscapes he travels widely across uh, across uh, across India uh, so you know the landscapes of, of Mandu the landscape of of uh, of, um, of Gujarat uh, various experiments that he that he conducts uh, and you know e even in uh, and then he you know also orders many paintings uh, uh, to be made to 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 bolster his own description so um, so in that sense, it, the, the, the book itself, after having read it, I recommend it to everybody because it's very accessible and it really presents the picture of a very, a curious man in both senses of the word. You know, he, he was an oddball, but he was also a man of prodigious curiosity and uh, that makes him very... Uh, of course, something. of course. Just, just, just you know, on, on that theme of food, since you have also written on Babur, uh, and Babur Nama has this famous passage in which Babur is lamenting yeah on the absence of good fruits and yeah. flowers uh, and good-looking women mm -hmm. in Hindustan. So uh, he is sort of pining for the peaches, the apricots, the melons yeah. that he had left yeah. behind in Kabul. Uh, the only thing that passes master <coughs> yes. for now is the mango. Yes. So that's Babur. But yes. Jahangir, when yes. he travels to Kabul, yes. and you know, he's enjoying and you know, he's, he's, he's enjoying the fruits of trees planted once by Babur and all that, but he says that all of this is good. Melon is good, yeah. but nothing compares yeah. to the Hindustani mango. Yes. Yes. That's a transition yes. of and and would you call that a transition towards the Mughals becoming completely Indian? 
as it were. To me, it was a very striking moment. You know, you can't right. help but be struck by it because there is Babur reduced to tears when a consignment yes. of melons comes yes. to yes. him yes. from yes. from Kabul. He says, "I says mango is okay, bearable, but if, what <laughs> I will not do for a for a melon." And there's Jahangir. This is two generations yes. later. Goes to Kabul, eats all these apricot speeches, and I say, "All very well, but what you know, mango is the king of fruits." And so that is, it's the taste of home, yes, isn't it? Yes, and and yes, by yes, that time, yes. the home is India. Hindustan. Yes, so absolutely. Yes. What, what a wonderful <laughs> story. Um, Avik, again, going back to Darashuko and um, the point about, you know, Darashuko, unlike Jahangir, is this great what if kind of person. Uh, what if he would have gone on to become the king or the emperor? Um, and so it's one of the great counterfactuals of history that we sort of fondly toy with. And the again, the the image that sticks out of Darashiko to us is, is this mystic who is um, a superior being uh, who, who confers with, with religious men from different from different religions, uh, who, who, who knew Sanskrit, who translated these texts into, into Persian. Uh, Translate the Upanishad, Sare Akbar, of which we have a manuscript copy in the Victoria Memorial, also of the Majma ul Bahrain, uh, his treatise on comparative religions. So he comes across as a man who is far advanced uh, from his age. And so, do you think that this is th this is a this is a this is a true representation of the man? He was, you know, what what do, do what what would be your take on? this what if on this counterfactual that would he have if he had gone on to become the king then would we have had so much communal strife or would we have had even colonial rule what would be your take on that? um so Jantada, first up is that the truth yes is that the whole truth about him no of course not <laughs> right so let's first talk about the truth in a, in a slightly deeper fashion um the common perception is that in the entire Mughal dynasty, whenever you're talking about, of course, secularism is a modern word, but syncretism, um, it's essentially Akbar with Din Elahi and Sulikul, and then there's nothing. There's a little flickering of a diya called Darashuko, and when that goes down, this is you know this sheer slide to 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 damnation, to perdition, right? Um, and I'm going to stray into Parvati territory here, but that's not true because. Uh, the Majlisi Jahangiri shows us that when Jahangir was Salim, he was a rebel, a Bagi, then everything that the emperor, his father, did was wrong. But when he becomes the Shahanshah himself, he has a similar Ibadat Khana and he has these similar religious discourses. So it's not as if there's Akbar and there's a little bit of Dara and there's nothing else, right? So, <coughs> so definitely there is a continuity in terms of being pluralistic in terms of being not just secular in a modern sense, but just being open-minded, being curious. And what Francois Bernier says about Dara is kind of similar to what, what's been said about Jahangir. Not that he could not have faith, not that part, but he was almost like a vessel and you could pour the water in, right, in any which way. So, and Francois Bernier goes on to say that with a Jesuit, he was a Jesuit with a Hindu yogi, he was a Hindu yogi with a Sufi, he was a, he was a Sufi, right? So he, was, he had this eternal yearning yeah. for spiritual truth. And I'll draw another parallel with, with Jahangir, if I may. So Jahangir was, in, in those days, right, a naturalist, a scientist, a man with deeply analytical ability towards all that was in the external world around him. In a similar fashion, Dara was probably an explorer, a naturalist of the soul. You see? So his, and he does this much lesser extent than, than Jahangir, uh, but there are his treatises, the risala i Haknuma, and you have the Sire Akbar, you have the Majmal Bahrain, uh, you have the Yoga Vashisht, to uh, which you know some of his scholars uh, in his in his pay uh, they they translated from the original Sanskrit into Persian, but he writes the foreword, and then you get a glimpse because this is Darashiko writing firsthand, so you get a glimpse of the man and his ethos. So he says, "I always thirsted for divine union with the Almighty, for for Tawhid, 
and having gone through the Quran and the Hadith, having gone through the book of Psalms and the book of Moses and the books of the Christians, I eventually turned my attention to the religion, to the ancient religion of Hindustan. And that is where he has, you know, this is a completely epiphanic, uh, you know, moment for him when he discovers, for instance, uh, and that's a completely subjective uh, discovery, which the ulema and, and any, anybody orthodox were completely opposed to, is that there's a surah in the Quran which talks about a hidden book, an ancient Quran, which is like the source of all scriptures. And he finds that in the Upanishads. And then he says, I, I absolutely have to translate this. This is my life's work. Right. Similarly, he would have these completely surreal but, but you know, very moving dreams. So Ramachandra and Yoga Vashish would appear to him in his dreams. And then he would wake up and say, I must get the Yoga Vashish uh, translated. Right? So, so, so that's, that's one, only one aspect of Darashiko's character. The other aspect of his character, which is far less well known and possibly far less publicized for, for, for many reasons, is that while he had this deep you know, generosity, this, this prodigious generosity of spirit and warm-heartedness, and he was def definitely a very dutiful and obedient son, a dutiful you know, husband and a father, uh, he was incredibly cold, he was arrogant, he was aloof towards the mass of courtiers across denominations. So on the one hand, he would propound himself as um, the friend and the supporter and the champion of the Hindus, and he would write to the Rajput Rajas. But when it came to the field of battle, for example, the aborted or uh, doomed campaign of Kandahar, it was the same man who alienated just one thing. It was the same man who, you know, riled... Uh, Sarup Singh and Rajup Singh and, and everybody else. So the alienation wasn't just of Sadullah Khan, uh, which uh, is a kind of similar rivalry like that of Abul Fazl and Jahangir, because Sadullah Khan was the, the Wazir Azam, the Prime Minister, old, seasoned, poised, and, and Darashik was opposed to him. So it's not just that, but even the Hindu Rajas he had opposed, which explains that right at the end, not the Battle of Samugar, but the final battle that he that he fights and loses uh, just off Ajmer uh, and on the passes of Derai, he doesn't have a single Rajput Raja on his side. By that time, Raja Jaswant Singh, with 20,000 Soars at the ready, who could have come to Dara Shikho's rescue, has you know, abstained, has stayed away from the battle, whereas Rajrup Singh and uh, Jai Singh are ferociously on the side of Aurangzeb fighting against Dar Ashiko, right? So yes. <coughs> in terms of what if, what would have happened uh, had he come to the throne? So, okay, in, in terms of fiscal policy, I, I dare say, um, you know, uh, you know, Professor Stiglitz might agree that when you have lower incidence of tax and a, and a flatter incidence of tax, the general populace is, isn't unhappy. So, uh, no, but, but on a serious note, uh, forget about the jizya, which was not there, which was reimposed, re reintroduced by Aurangzeb once he becomes Emperor Alamgir. But before that, during Shah Jahan's time, there was a pilgrim tax. So let's say you were in Delhi, and you were going to Banaras to offer pilgrimage, right? So instead of the fast tag that you have now, you would have to have, there would be a toll gate, and you would have to pay pilgrimage tax because you are a Hindu who is going for the purpose of pilgrimage like Tawaf, right? So you have to pay that. And uh, Jahanara, uh, Darashiko's daughter, um, sorry, Darashiko's uh, sister, together with uh, the brother Darashiko, they intercede with Shah Jahan and the pilgrimage tax is waived. So they would be purely from the perspective of economic policy or fiscal policy, they would not be extremely harsh or draconian measures, that's for sure. Right. But Dara Shiko was no military commander. He was no military ruler. And uh, whenever this came up, so during the Kandahar campaign, during the Battle of Samugar, and finally the, the tragic Battle of Derai, he was, he was a failure on the field of battle. And, and at that point in time, you had to be a, a military commander, a ruler. It was not enough to be a statesman. It, it, today, it is not important to be a military commander, to be a warlord, um, you know, making excuses for Trump, but, uh, but, but it's not essential to be uh, a ruler in a democratic society, but at that point of time, it, it definitely was. 
over and above that, if you take people like Humayun, who uh, were also uh, under the sway, great sway of astrologers and mystics of all denominations, so was Narashiko. So the, there were like definite failings in, in his character, which would have you know, made it difficult for him to sustain himself over a long reign, even had he succeeded to the throne. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure um, the audience have many questions, but before throwing it open, I have a quick question as a student of history to ask of you. Um, I have read history and have taught it for some time, but here I have just read two wonderful books of history by two people, Parvati read English literature first and then history, and you are perhaps the historian who never was. Uh, you, you are in the, in, the, in the corporate world. But these works, mind you, are works of nonfiction. They are solidly based on archives. You have, you have read everything that is you know, written on, on all of this. How do you think, and in, on, 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 I, I would just like to both of you to have quick comments on the craft of this, in which you are using the archives and also your creative imagination as authors of fiction also, to write books of history which gives us a sense of the age. The past is not on candid camera. We have not seen it happen. But you give us a sense of the age and the people who crowd those ages by, in a sense, using your imagination to go beyond the limits of the archive, as it were. Uh, and that perhaps makes a greater contribution to the craft of history uh, and to the popularization of history than conventional historians do. And if you could give us quick comments on, on how did you do that, and then we will. Uh, Sure. I think, you know, I think in uh, detail is always key, both in, uh, yes. in any kind of writing. You know, detail can really uh, bring a moment alive. And uh, so perhaps maybe I can give one example. Was You know, that I mean, it's clear just from just the most cursory knowledge of history that Akbar was a far greater emperor than his son Jahangir that he was a uh, that he achieved far more in his in his life than Jahangir did and Jahangir really was basking in the glories that he that he inherited and <coughs> it's not difficult to see that you know he would have been a very impressive man and there is there are some there are historical record to show that Akbar was also a man of quick temper he was he was he was very charismatic he could be very charming but he also had a temper and uh, there is a little line in uh, the Jahangir Nama when Jahangir is talking about his father. And he always talks about him in the most respectful, greatly affectionate terms. And he says, you know, he was, he was this very impressive figure. He had the body of a lion. He had this mole on his, on his nose that was very, very sort of very beautiful. And he says he had a very loud voice. And, and to me, it struck me. And I suppose this, this would be a liberty I took as a sort of from my sort of write experience of writing fiction, is that you know if this man is in his thirties writing a memoir and still remembers the loudness of his father's voice, perhaps you know as a child he 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 remembers being a little uh, intimidated by it. You know this 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 really uh, impressive, highly ach high achieving emperor. Uh, who you know, whose voice is booming through the through the zenana, and perhaps scaring his little sons a little bit. So that that imagination I had, I, you know, in my uh, in my head, and I, I mean, I tried not to let it run away with me too much, but but it did inform sort of you know my how I wrote about their relationship, which I thought was a very affecting relationship because this is a a, a prince who will never be able to match his father's expectations, and yet he is also a prince who is born. Uh, with you know, f at, as a result of great prayers, that famous story of Salim Chishti and how how much Akbar wanted a son and how much he wanted an heir and this boon that was granted him and how thrilled he was when Jahangir was born, and eventually how disappointed. So, um, so I guess maybe that's just one example. But detail was always a yes, key. Yes, of course, of course. Thank uh, you, Avik. Uh, so, Jantada, in writing Dara Shikho, I did something that was you know, bravado to the point of being foolhardy, and I've promised myself never to do that again. Uh, because although I had access to all of the, the rich scholarship that's been there on the Mughals 
for the last 100 years, so all the way from Jodhanath Shorkar to Otto Trushki and Sanjay Subramanian, Zafaralam, and, and, and others, um, what I should have, could have done, is right at the outset, reach out to the experts, take their guidance, you know, and, and kind of morph the, the text around that and have a process of feedback, etc. And I did nothing of that sort. Um, I, I just wanted to... Good that you didn't. <laughs> I wanted to kind of remain in the flow. Um, and I said, I had a discussion with my editor, Rahul Soni, and also um, Priya Swami, actually the, the agent who we both work with. And both of them said, look, you can do it both ways, as nonfiction, which is far more academic, and as nonfiction, which is far more engaging and accessible. And they advised me, because you've written fiction before, uh, similar to Parvati, why don't you, the, the treatment, the presentation of it, why can't it be in, in a novelistic style, while adhering to historical authenticity all through? And that's, that's what I went for. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I gather <coughs> that for their next projects, uh, Parvati is going one generation up. And Ovik, who has tried his hand, apart from management consulting, he has tried his hand at poetry, at, at history, and then now he's turning into a playwright for your next project. So if you could just tell us briefly about your next projects, and then we'll uh, throw up the floor to the audience. Well, as you say, I'm going back a generation, so I'm doing Akbar now. Right. And a very, very different, very different man from Jahangir. Very, I mean, Jahangir was intimidated. I am a little intimidated myself, just tackling him. And uh, often, I think we read historians writing about Akbar. It's, uh, most of them seem to have been intimidated by him. He's so, you know, he's just so overwhelming. But he's a challenge, and I'm, I'm looking forward to. I mean, I'm keeping my fingers crossed uh, for that book. Wonderful, Avik. Um, so yes, in terms of the play, I've written a, a very small, um, like four-scene play based on the Darashuko book, and to my great fortune, uh, Podatik have have agreed to to put it on production. Oh, congratulations! So, so Fantastic. So they'll probably do a Hindustani version of it first, and, sure. and then and then we'll see. And in terms of a book, um, I do definitely want to do a, a historical biography again soon, and we'll we'll see. I'll I'll come to you for advice. Okay, okay, okay. So. Okay, so watch this space <laughs> in the future. I'm sure you, you must have many, many questions. We have some time for questions. So if you could just please identify yourself briefly and, and please keep the questions short and pointed. Yes, please. There should be some cordless. Uh, okay, we'll get back to you. Hello. Yeah, my name is Shudipa Bose. Uh, thank you, both of you, for the wonderful insights and the explanations that you've done about your fascinations with the characters and the why, what led you to it. Now, both uh, Parvati and Avik, if the two of you were to sit together and compare notes about your two protagonists, what would you be saying to each other? Something, any similarities, any continuum that you see, or lots of dis similarities? Maybe one similarity, one dissimilarity. I, I would definitely find a similarity not between Jahangir and Dara, but between Jahangir's son and Dara. Jahangir's son, Khusro, was, uh, was another of these sort of lost characters in history. You know, almost made it, might have, God knows what would have happened if he had, because he, Akbar wanted him and many people, he had a very strong backing in the Mughal court to be the next emperor, because nobody trusted this Jahangir with his 20 goblets and all that to, to actually rule uh, properly. But uh, you know, Jahangir managed, and then Khusro was kept prisoner for, for, all, for almost the entire duration of Jahangir's reign. Right at the end, uh, he met a very tragic fate. He was handed over to Shah Jahan, his own brother, who uh, had him uh, killed. Uh, but you know, he, he's a kind of uh, a, a sort of precursor to Dara, in a sense, you know, this, this sort of man who this man who might have been. Um, yeah, another sort of dissimilarity, uh, which is sort of contrary to the popular perception of Jahangir as this completely ineffectual rake, this dissolute man, is I think Jahangir in his own way was a fairly bright person. I mean, in his moments of lucidity, uh, he would talk, uh, and again, this is from the Jahangir Nama and the Tuzuki Jahangiri. He would talk of consolidating his base um, at the Akbari Fort in Ajmer and use that to go to make further inroads into, into Rajasthan and sending his son Kuram 
to finally once and for all subjugate Mewar and and bring the Mewar prince to you know uh, as as a hostage as as almost as a prisoner to the Mughal court. It's it's all Jahangir, right? And there's this line which which you know stuck in my mind, and he says everything depends on timing. And I was like, my God, I mean that could be you know from a Harvard Business Review or a Gartner or a Forrester Journal in today's days, because he's talking about timing for any kind of a strategy that you're talking about. Uh, Dara Shukho is 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 a you know different constellation from that. I mean, he would definitely plan, but he would plan projects uh, where he would take the principal Upanishads and he would assemble Brahmins from Benares um, one time uh, during the late 1650s when he did not accompany his his father Shah Jahan. Uh, you know, when on his excursion out of Delhi, he says, "I have very important work to do," and this is the important work. Uh, so their their strategies and their planning were like in completely different. You know, come. Uh, my name is Sri Joydeep, and uh, <laughs> thank you for this enlightening discussion on the Mughal Empire. Uh, I have a specific question on the uh, because specifically on this Mughal period, if you see Akbar uh, period, there was a origin of the Indian classical music. And mostly you have Tanshen, and then you have his Guru Haridash, and then afterwards you have Tanshen converted into Muslim. And so how do you see, I mean, what was their influence? Is the ruler bringing a big influence on origination of uh, the classical music? Or is it just, uh, how, how do you see it? What your, is your take on it? <laughs> I that will be in Parvati's next book, <laughs> yeah. not this one. But yeah. yeah, no. Yes. So I can't really, you know, I, I I haven't studied sort of the the the, the music or classical music origins in any depth. So I can't really answer uh, the question that you asked. I can only tell you one little story that I enjoyed, which is uh, again from the Jahangir Nama about the death of Salim Chishti. And it seems when Salim Chishti died, the on his deathbed, the last thing he asked for was for Tansin to come and sing to him. And I thought that was quite, uh, you know, that was really a kind of metaphor for the Mughal court in Akbar's time. You know, this dying Sufi ch uh, saint who asks for Tansen to come and sing to him on his uh, on his deathbed. Thank you for a very fascinating uh, conversation. As you were talking about uh, speculation on the course of history dependent on the characters, I couldn't help but think about the man who became the king following, and that's Aurangzeb. And I don't know how uh, the actual facts, as opposed to whether it's a more romantic, hyped-up tale, but about the prince when he goes to Burhanpur and meets Hirabai. And that's the time when he actually was apparently tempted to drink alcohol, and he was a proficient vena player. And after that, uh, uh, allegedly following Hirabai's death, he kind of becomes a much more coarse in character. So had Hirabai existed for longer, would we have seen a different Aurangzeb and the course of history? Uh, that, that would be in the realm of, of, of pure speculation. Um, it, it's, it's you know similar to, again, had, had Dara Shukov become emperor, what would have happened? Um, for any kind of speculation to be remotely sensible, it has to be within the ambit of academic formulation, right? Um, one way of addressing it is not through the sphere of history at all, but political economy. Um, so, you know, political economists have these mathematical models and formulations. And uh, there is, interestingly, uh, a work that's, that, that's there in the American Economic Review, which talks about the fact that if you have a ruler who, is, who has a council of advisors, Right? Is is it likely that it's going to be less unilateral? Is it likely the decisions will be less didactic, and therefore, is it is it much more likely that the economy as a whole is is going to be in a superior level of utility, like a parity superior state? So, you know, if Aurangzeb had become, you know, a different kind of a ruler, or had become like Dara would have been, then yes, possibly. Now, I I have been seeing these frantic hand gestures. Uh, conveying to me that, that we can continue this discussion uh, for some time more, because next speaker hasn't yet arrived. But Parvati has a flight to catch. She is on her way.
to the Jaipur Literary Festival. So uh, maybe do you have uh, any more time left, or would you like we can we can we can continue this dis discussion, or we can uh, take your questions and. Yes. And okay. I will have to apologetically leave. This was, I'm very sorry to have to do this, but this was a, it was a wonderful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Parvati. Thank, thank, you. thank you for and your thank you, Avi. Thank wonderful you. book thank on Jahangir. Uh, but we, we do you have do you have another couple of minutes? Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Parvati, and have a great have a great sessions in in Jaipur Literary Festival. And we look forward to another session on your book on Akbar. Yes, absolutely. I look, I, I, please, please keep your fingers crossed for me. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yes, we have a question here. Can you, can you yeah, just, just pass the cordless mic to her? I think the, the other people have to hear it. I have a quick question. It was actually to both the authors, uh, but they, you can answer me. Uh, I, I'm just curious that uh, despite all this historical material which was available to you, why did you choose the format of historical nonfiction or historical biography instead of writing a historical novel, uh, so to say? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. In fact, when I was just starting the project, I did ponder this, this very question because I'd written a novel before and I was thinking, look, there is enough material for it to be credible and still become pure fiction where you could sort of go into many more sort of imaginings and, and further dramatizations of what actually occurred. And then it, it sort of came to me... It, it dawned on me that doing so would actually dilute um, the the main message, maybe that I was that I was trying to bring forward to Darashiko, um, and which is particularly germane in today's narrative. Right, uh, as Parvati said, you have the paradigm of the good Mughal and the bad Mughal, the good Muslim and the bad Muslim, and anachronistically the good Indian, Darashiko being the you know touted as the emblem of Indianness, uh, anachronism by two and a half centuries, um, and the, the bad Indian, you know, Aurangzeb. Um, and what I've tried to do in my narrative is show through various instances, through various incidents, that there were sh various, various shades of, of, you know, failings and um, attribute skills in both Darashiko as well as Aurangzeb. And I think that kind of a, of a dispassionate, uh, you know, discussion may have been a little difficult in a, in a novel format. Right, we have two hands up on the back. At the back. Cordless mics, please, at the back. Is anybody there with cordless mics to pass on? At the, at the hands raised at the back. Please at the back. Somebody should stand here with the cordless mic so that they can pass them on to those with questions at the back. We'll okay, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to understand a little more about the um, about the connections between the Rajput kings and the Mughals. You spoke about how it was different with Aurangzeb and Dara Shuko. Can you please explain how exactly that was and why it was that maybe the Rajput kings spoke, I means uh, sided with Aurangzeb, who was much more a different kind of a ruler uh, than Dara Shuko. Uh, means how was the connections? What kind of stuff was there? Maybe you could elaborate that a bit more. Um, sure. Parvati would have been the ideal person to answer the first part of that question because it, it, you have to look at the relationship across five or six generations, so starting with Babur. So when Babur comes, he comes in as an invader. He does not come in as a, a Shahanshah or a Jahapana, right? Because he's entering enemy territory 
So every single battle that he fights against the Rajputs, in particular Rana Sangha, is, is a complete engagement of aggression and nothing else. So Humayun is, is a lesser military general. So he had enough problems trying to deal with, with fractions within his own sort of entourage, particularly his, his brother uh, Kamran Mirza, and then the, the rise of the Afghans under, under Shesha Suri to really bother too much about, the, about the, the Rajputs. When it comes to Akbar, that is where you see the grand transition, right? Because, and again, this is more poverty territory than, than mine. You want to me, please keep, keep, me, keep me honest. <coughs> is that Akbar has this then dual policy. Wherever his, his first gambit, if you will, is through diplomacy, is through tact. And that is where he wins over Raja Man Singh as, as one archetype. At the other end of the spectrum is Maharana Pratap, who cannot be wooed over through diplomacy. But even then, it is, he does not appear on the field of battle himself at Hardegati. It is his intermediate. And he could have sent out his army under a, a Mughal or, or a Muslim general. But it was actually Raja Man Singh. That's the, that's the curious irony of it, right? And, and this cannot be anything but deliberate on Akbar's part. That he assigns Raja Man Singh to go and attack Mewar, right? And then, then you have the famous battle of, of Haldigati. When you go post Akbar, with the except around Jahangir's time and well into Shah Jahan's time, the only thorn in their flesh was Mewar. All the other Rajput Radhas had become effectively their vassals. And as a result of that, they were rewarded. So you have this concept of the Jagir. So if my, my father gets a Jagir, um, it lasts till his lifetime. And I don't inherit it, unfortunately. Okay? But you have this concept of a Watan Jagir, where you have a, a Suba or a province or, 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 this, or this princely state. Uh, and the concept of the Watan Jagir is so long as you prove your, your continued support and loyalty to the Mughal regime, to the monarchs, your, that is in succession. So your sons and, and their progeny can inherit the entire Watan or, or that territory, right? So that comes into play. That comes into focus. So it's, it's, so it's a policy of assimilation. It's a policy of, of, of befriending the Rajputs, of co-opting the brave Rajput Sawars into the rank and file of the, the Mughal army of the Shahi Forge and making sure that commanders of merit were promoted, were given charge of armies, where even there would be cases where you'd have a, a Rajput commander going out to, to battle against the enemy. And there are cohorts, there are, there are squadrons or companies of Muslim fighters under his, under his charge. And that continues all the way till, till Shah Jahan right? and, and beyond. Although there are interludes where Mewar continues to be a problem. When we come to, to Aurangzeb, and this is the great, uh, I think, insight, one of the eye-openers for me, is that Aurangzeb, before he becomes the Emperor Alamgir, is an extremely shrewd, astute um, diplomat, politician, uh, definitely, you know, Krishnan Srinivasan sir would have had a lot to discuss with him at, at, around that time, because great amount of tact and diplomacy is used, not brute force, to win over the Rajput rulers one by one. So you have the case of Rajrup Singh, you have the case of Jai Singh, and also the case of Jaswant Singh, who, after losing out to Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb does not go to Jodhpur after him. Aurangzeb does not go all out to, you know, kill uh, all the Sawas and, and raise Jodhpur to the ground. Instead, through Jai Singh, he sends messages to Jaswan Singh that come over to our side and we will give you more Jagis, we will give you more Khilat, we will give you more honors and more promotions that you could have ever imagined. It, it's a very different policy once he becomes Emperor Alang, um, Alamgir and, and then becomes far more didactic. I think we probably have, yes. No, no, no. <laughs> I've just. I, I think this was a perfect answer. I guess. Yes, I think we can have one more question, probably, or or more. Do we have one? Yes, yes. So we will. This, this will be the last question, please. 
Good afternoon. My name is Mrinalini. Uh, my question to you is, you know, yesterday we had Dr. Shashi Tharoor here uh, in his uh, book, The Era of Darkness. He's spoken a lot about how whatever the British looted from India, they repatriated most of it, right? There was no, uh, I mean, as a proportion of what they looted, uh, what was invested in the country was a minuscule proportion. How would you say that the Mughals compared in that respect? How much would you say that applied to the Mughals? Um, right, so as there was just, that was one part of what um, Shashi Tharoor said, right? He did talk about the fact that there was a redistribution of uh, the wealth that was appropriated from, from the land. He did not say it was an equitable redistribution. M big, big economic difference, right? And what Shashitara said that there were, there were edifices, there were mosques, there were buildings, there were mausoleums, etc., which meant that the, uh, the tax money, the revenue that was, that was earned, a lot of that went back into work that provided employment and sort of sustained or buoyed the, if I, if I may sort of extend uh, Shishi Thiru's argument, buoyed the economy to a large extent, right? But that is, that is one part of the question. The second part of the question is, was it an equitable distribution? Particularly when you get into the latter stage of the Mughal regime, particularly uh, when, when Aur Aurangzeb, um, Alamgir, leaves Delhi and campaigns for long decades in the Deccan, uh, there is tremendous amount of corruption that, that's, that's been documented there. And it's, it's, uh, it's rife with corruption, it's rife with nepotism, it's, it's rife with extortion money. So that is definitely towards the latter part from the, the late 16, maybe 70s, 80s onwards, uh, that slide has already, already started. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that, that makes sense. One, one of the I think the critical difference between the Mughals and, and the British were that the Mughals, I mean, there was a lot of re redistribution of wealth under Mughal rule. And, uh, you know, towards the end of Aurangzeb's reign, uh, there is all of these revolts by the Sikhs, the Marathas, the Rajputs, the Rohila Afghans, everybody, you know, and, and, and these Mughal Subhas are becoming or almost semi autonomous, independent. Uh, and that also leads to a huge regionalization, the shifting of the dynamics of Indian history from the center in Delhi to the regions like, like Awadh or, or Hyderabad or Bengal, Murshidabad. So uh, unlike the British, there is a lot of churning within Mughal India with a dis redistribution of wealth. But it's all eventually a movement of capital and resources within the Indian subcontinent that that crucially marks out the 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 Mughal system from something like the Plassey plunder or the drain of wealth uh, under colonial rule. Uh, I I think we um, we had some some very interesting questions and again so we will um, we will end our discussion here and so. Thank you so much, you. Avik Chanda, for your wonderful book on Dara Shuko, which I, as a student of history, learned a lot from. And please buy this book uh, and read it, and then um, engage with, with, because this is a wonderful, this, this, this conveys the flavor of the age and, and this fascinating person who, whom we have, we are sort of fond of, but in very stereotypical terms. You have you have brought a, brought across to us a real flavor of, of the man and his age as is really well. So thank you very much, Ovik, for writing this book and we look forward to another historical biography of another person who will remain unnamed for now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, you Joanthada, and thank you uh Joanthada. We have had to swap the session, so you will come up for the next session. So maybe